Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, lovely to see you all here um, on a sunny uh, holiday. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to come and, um, and celebrate with us. Um, I think it's a really lovely opportunity um, to find out more about what happened and all the hard work that went into um, saving the pottery um, and um, also an opportunity to thank people. Um, that's what we're trying to do this year, is really to acknowledge all of the hard work and thank everybody that was involved in saving the pottery and um, have a chance to kind of look at how it evolved and, and where we've got to. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm really grateful for you all to come today. Um, we've um, got a couple of housekeeping things. There's no fire alarm planned, so if the alarm does go off, Please go out the way that you came. There's tea and coffee at the back. Um, please help yourselves. Uh, don't feel like you have to sit still. If you want to get up, uh, there are biscuits. Um, help yourselves. And um, also, feel free to ask questions. This is meant to be a discussion rather than uh, people just um, you know sitting at the front and, and telling you things. So um, we are interested in questions and um, you know, having a discussion as we go. Um, Oh, I think the final thing is toilets are downstairs. We need to go to those. Um, so I'm going to introduce Simon Alding, who's the Chair of Trustees um, and also Director of the Craft Study Centre in Farnham. And he's going to be um, chairing and um, managing questions, <laughs> all of those sorts of things, and we'll give introductions. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie. And um, it's a great honour and a privilege uh, for me to be here, and, and that sense of using this occasion as a kind of conversation amongst all of us, uh, and a celebration of uh, for this session in particular, you know that the remarkable turbulence of ten years. I mean, I, it, I, for me, it feels as though it was a very long time ago, and as if it were almost yesterday. Uh, and personally, it's been a great privilege to have played a very small part uh, in working with uh, you all. So. Uh, the way um, that I'd like, if I can, to uh, manage this first session is first to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, on my right, John Bedding, uh, who you will all know. <laughs> 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 uh, of all me loved, uh, very important Potter. I hope, John, you, perhaps you may be able to say something in the course of this hour. Uh, about the recent residence that, that you've done in Japan, and that will help us locate this time, uh, the beach pottery as two things, perhaps, as something that is deeply entrenched in this place, that is deeply local, but also is deeply and profoundly international. Uh, how could that else be in some times? Uh, Lady Carol Holland, the founder chair of the Leach Pottery. Um, <laughs> There are many formidable figures in this room, but I think probably none that's formidable. <laughs> <laughs> what she did, of course, with a very great number of people, uh, the legacy is here, so it's lovely that you're here with us. Thank you, sir. We're going to start the session off, actually, in a, in a slight form way that uh, uh, Carol's going to just do a, a, a presentation, a kind of little mini lecture, and then I'll ask Carol to conclude the session. And then, all equally important, the, the role of local government in these activities is often unsung and underplayed. And there is nobody who has played a more significant or more important mm -hmm. part in galvanizing that really essential community and local authority support than Tams and Daniel. So please welcome mm -hmm. Tams and Daniel. <laughs> Carol, would you start us off? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I hope you'll excuse me that I've sort of turned this my bit of this into a into a more formal talk because when, what I I did was I thought well I better tell, say a little bit about the early days of the pottery and when I started doing that and looking up files and things I found that there was an awful lot of history and. And I think it's useful to, to tell you a little bit about the, the history part, but um, you're uh, welcome to start uh, doing slow clapping or anything <laughs> if it goes on too long. Uh, if you've had enough, and I'll hand over to somebody else. But um, 
So what I'm going to do then is to talk about the early history of the pottery from, well, really, from 1920, when Bernard came uh, and Hammerder came back to Britain and, and founded the pottery. So please excuse me if I read this to you, because it's very difficult to remember all the dates. So it started in the year two, uh, 1920, when two young, or at least youngish potters, set out from the town of Dines to walk up to a rather grand house called Tremorna, which occupied a magnificent situation overlooking St. Ives Bay and Carbis Bay Beach. Tremorna's actually the house next door to where I live, so I felt very, very uh, keen that I should include Tremorna in here. Tremorna was the home of Francis Horn. Now, in the early days of the leaf pottery, Francis Horn was extremely important. She was a widow whose husband had made his money trading with companies in the Far East. And Frances was something of an arts and crafts patron. She had already founded an arts and crafts group in St. Ives. And because of her husband's interests in the, in the Far East, she had already shown an interest in the potter Bernard Leach, who had been born in Hong Kong and was already well known as a potter in Japan. So when Bernard came back to Britain, the first thing he did was to go up and see his patron. So returning by sea in 1920 to Britain, where uh, Bernard was accompanied by his potter friend Shoji Hamada, who was no doubt amazed to find himself travelling to St. Ives, which he probably never heard of. <coughs> Bernard wanted to set up a pottery in the UK, but needless to say, he didn't have any money. He was a potter after all, not a banker. And I don't think he cared particularly where in Britain he set it up. But his potential backer was in St. Ives. So he came to see her, and his visit proved to be worth the journey, and crucial for the future of uh, the leech pottery. Mrs. Horn agreed to put up enough money for him to get started, and Bernard subsequently located a promising site in the countryside, west of the town, <coughs> It had a stream running constantly along one boundary, that's the Stanick uh, River, a very important factor for a new pottery. And the field was far enough away from residential developments, at that time it was, so that Bernard could be sure that the smutty smoke from the wood-burning kilns would not be a problem for local residents. With Francis Horn's financial help, he purchased the site, and with Shoji Hamada's professional help, he set about building his pottery. The, uh, what we call now, we call the old pottery, as you see it now, is very much as Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada had it built. The famous three-chambered kiln, designed and built by the kiln specialist, now I've got to pronounce this one, <laughs> Tsurunosuka Matsubayashi. John, mm -hmm. I got that nearly Sounds right. about right. <laughs> <laughs> was the first Japanese-style kiln to be built in the West and a model for many since. For nearly 60 years, until his death in May 1979, aged 92, Bernard was based mainly in St. Ives. He was acknowledged as the most influential potter in the world and the father of modern studio pottery movement. His writings, especially a potter's book, were virtually compulsory reading for all aspiring potters. He had personally trained over a hundred young potters. His achievements had been recognised by the rare title of Companion of Honour, conferred by the Queen, by an honorary doctorate from the Royal College of Arts, and by numerous honours in Japan, where he is still regarded with awe and respect. The prestige of the name of Leech has been kept alive by his, his late son David, his grandson John, who's still a, an active potter, and by other family members, members who have continued the leech tradition by founding potteries of their own. After Bernard's death, the leech pottery continued to be the workplace and home of his third uh, wife. Some of you may remember Janet, Janet Leach, nay Darnell, American lady, 
and quite a formidable lady. I don't know if you remember her. Texan. By, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By then, Pottery Cottage had been built on the site as a residence, and this was Janet's house. When she died in 1997, she left the house to her business partner, Mary Boots Redgrave, uh, with whom she had founded the gallery in Fourth Street called The New Craftsman. That was uh, founded by Janet and, uh, and Boots Redgrave. And, but the pottery itself remained with the Leach family. By the year 1999, both parts of the site were separately available for sale but not attracting much interest. And it was at, that, at this stage that Alan and Sally Gillam stepped in to purchase both parts of the site. Alan now runs the hotel down in the town, as you probably know, uh, the Western Hotel. The ground floor of the house was opened as a leech museum, and a wooden annex was converted to house a new showroom, which was opened in February 2000. At this stage, it was not pot possible to open the old pottery itself to the public for health and security reasons. However, the pottery never died completely as a base for making pots, as Trevor Corsa, Joe Wason, and Amanda Brier continued to make work on the site. And you probably, some of you remember all of those. Early in 2003, Alan and Sally Gillam placed the whole site on the market hoping to attract a suitable purchaser who could undertake the considerable restoration work that was urgently <coughs> needed and to safeguard this important piece of cultural heritage for the future. I first got involved in the spring of 2003 when I was approached separately by the artist Michael O'Donnell and by potters Andy uh, McGuinness and David Binch all of whom had been campaigning for some action to rescue the pottery. I mean, at that stage, there was a decided possibility the whole thing would fall to bits and, and it would be lost completely. A representative of the National Trust Southwest also came to my home for a discussion following from my earlier involvement in Tate uh, St. Ives Action Group. And some interest was developing at county level uh, at that stage. The Leach Pottery Restoration Project really dated from the 15th of September 2003 when Cornwall County Council and what was then Creative Kerno organised a meeting in Truro of representatives of various organisations to explore the feasibility of initiating a rescue plan. At that meeting, which both John and I attended and Tamsin was there as well, a loosely structured steering group was established and I was subsequently asked to chair this group. That's why I'm standing up here <laughs> telling you all this. The first thing I did as chair was to ring up Harry Isaacs, who was mayor of St. Ives at the time, and asked him to join the group. I knew how important it was to have the town council involved and supportive which they always have been. St. Ives Town Council has always supported us, as has the County Council. Creative Kerno, later subsumed into the County Council, provided administrative support in the form of their staff member, Ben Veshko. I haven't seen Ben for years. I don't know quite where he, what he's doing now. Uh, who played an important role in holding <coughs> the project together before the formation of the charitable company in 2005. Uh, we were also indebted to what I've called here the late lamented Penrith District Council and particularly to its chief executive Jim McKenna for agreeing to spearhead the project, provide officer time and support from Tamsin Daniel and in due course to appoint the project manager Peter Cowley. And I haven't seen Peter for many years either. Now, <clears throat> that was where I thought I would stop and pass on to Tamsin for the moment, because uh, I think that this next phase, the, the restoration project and the uh, fundraising and all that side of it, yeah. Tamsin was very, very uh, important, as was Peter Cowling. 
And uh, so, Tamsin, can I pass it on to yeah. you to do your bit uh, at this stage? Do you want to come and stand up here? Or you do it stand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can stand. Thank you, Carol. Have my... Thank you. So, um, I'm Tamsin Daniel. I am the uh, culture manager at Cornwall Council. When this project kicked off, though, I was um, heritage officer at Penwith District Council. Yeah. And it was a new job, and I'd been in it only a few years by then. And so this was actually the first major capital project that I, in the end, ran from sort of start to finish in terms of the whole project management sort of side of stuff. So I got involved because Penwith Digital Council was one of those few councils then that really recognised the value of culture for regeneration and for jobs and the whole how to um, promote Penwith as a place to live, work, visit, all those sorts of things. And we had a number of councillors on the council who recognised the value of the leech pottery and were upset by the condition that it had gone into, but saw the real potential um, to create another sort of destination for visitors, but very much around creative industries, so not the sort of bucket and spade market that just comes when the weather's good in the summer, but a place which would attract people all year round. So I was a sort of heritage officer at that time. That's John Leach. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> actually. Lovely one. Yeah. And I think one of the things which was so great about this project, and I think one of the things where Penwith Council and Cornwall Council really recognised was actually the international profile of the site, the international yeah. relationship that was there already, which in some ways um, had been sort of forgotten in some respect, hadn't been sort of fully exploited, not exploited in a negative way, but exploited in terms of the real importance that we have for relationships I think, between place and people and you know, the creative industries and stuff like that as well. So my first task, I suppose, was to raise the money. And what you're looking at, the, these early pictures, that's not early enough, but the ones where it looks really like a cow shed, which I think is what it, that, yeah, yeah, that one there. So this is when the council actually bought the site, um, which is quite a brave thing for a council to do, because in fact that is a grade two star building. Actually, they're all grade two star. And the climbing kiln inside is, in fact, a scheduled monument. And now, for those of you who have dealt with planning, planning is bad enough. It's even worse when you have a grade two listed. Even worse if you've got a grade two star, and horrendous if you've got a scheduled monument as well. <laughs> so it was never going to be a cheap project. And we estimated it, I think we had to raise about 1.7 million, which sounds quite small fry. Because you know, these days I'm running a couple of 20 million pound projects and they seem not small but like normal. But 1.7 then was quite, yeah. a, quite a lot and for a district council to sort of take ownership of what was in effect a ruin and feel confident that we could raise that amount of money. The strength of it really was the fact that you had an amazing group of people who were so determined to make sure the project was going to happen. And the other thing to remember as well was we had a moment in time with European funding early days of lottery funding, and a district council that had some cash. We don't have much cash these days. Um, and that package got pulled together. So this was, it attracted European funding because of the workspaces. So it was actually about creative industry workspaces and creating new jobs and employment and those sorts of things and training and skills. It attracted heritage lottery funding because of the historic buildings. And then we just council did the sort of the gaps in between, just sort of the glue to put, put those all together. It was quite, I think, what I really enjoyed about that very first meeting, my background had very much been in museums, I was actually a, um, a curator, and what I felt was really important in this project, I think, John, you probably said it at the meeting first, that they didn't want this to be sort of just become a museum, a heritage site. It had to be, the only value of the project really was for it to be a living legacy, for it to be something about um, the tradition which was set up there, you know, nearly 100 years ago now, continuing, an opportunity for people within the community, if they had even no pottery background at all, the opportunity to come through the system to learn how to become a potter through the standard wear and things like that. And so from the very start, we absolutely wanted to have the new studios. So it wasn't just going to be in the historic buildings. You wanted to have proper studio spaces for um, you know, professional potters, really. And we had an interesting relationship then with Falmouth University, that they were all for it. And they put in £10,000 a year for the first three years with the idea they were going to send students across. Never happened, unfortunately. And we all know what happened with the Falmouth University ceramics yep. course, which is shocking. And when you've got in Cornwall one of the largest groups of 
potters outside London and your own university closes down in the ceramics course, I think that does say something. So this is the sort of, you know, what we took over. Um, the other challenge, I suppose, is, and it's a challenge I still have when I do a lot of projects these days, is that in some respects capital is quite easy. It's the revenue funding which is really hard. Mm. And so whilst I'm hugely proud of the project we did, I still feel immensely guilty that on day one, when the trust had to open the doors, they had nothing in the bank account whatsoever. We, didn't, as a, we weren't as a council able to give them a revenue fund for the first few years or anything at all. So we sort of created, as it were, the baby was born, and then we hand it over to the trust and say, here, come and you know, make it work, make it be a success. And by the way, we're not giving you any cash at all to make that happen. And I think the only thing we did as a council was we sort of underwrote your staff redundancy, so you could actually be a charity and not have to hold you know, the first quarter of your finances, you know, all that sort of daft stuff, really. Um, I think for me now, so 10 years on, when I was sort of head of culture at Cornwall Council, we have really seen the importance of the creative industries in Cornwall. It's one of the few sort of growth industries that we have, and it's probably way too boring for most of you to have read it, but the council has produced with the Level Enterprise Partnership a thing called Ten Opportunities, which is about the sort of where we see Cornwall in the future and what areas of our industries we actually feel have the potential to grow. And opportunity number one is called creative. And I think the leech pottery, if we hadn't done the leech pottery 10 years ago, I don't think the profile of creative industries in Cornwall would be anything like where it is now. I think what this, what this project demonstrated was, although it is a very small site, it is internationally significant. And the relationship that you then made with Japan, and of course Mashiko also did a big fundraising appeal when we came to save the pottery. And they raised, I can't remember how much it was, but it was quite a substantial amount they gave towards the actual project itself. And then of course from that as well, there became this sort of relationship, not a twinning, but a sort of a, what do you call it? A friendship. A friendship between Mashiko and St. Ives. And when Mashiko had the earthquake, you know, a little while later, again, the Leech Pottery coordinated all the sort of fundraising on this side to send over to help Mashiko. And it's those sorts of relationships. And I think, putting my sort of Cornwall Council hat on, um, post-Brexit, a dreadful word, we have incredible relationships around the world, which we have some it's forgotten about. We have the Cornish diaspora, so six million people who see their link as being Cornish from the Cornish mining industry and the rest. And we have relationships like this with the Leech Pottery in Japan. And I think those are the things which actually we now need to really nurture to keep these sort of industries going. I mean, I'm hugely proud of this project. It's one that I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm from St. Ives. My parents had a Bernard Leach um, dinner service as their wedding present. I've been brought up with Bernard Leach in the house. Um, when I went to the DNA as a curator there, um, I spent quite a lot of time in the ceramics department at the DNA. So when this project came up, it was like, absolutely, this is a project I want to do. It meant something to me personally. And I think actually with projects which are hard to get over the line, having that personal sort of passion about it really does help, because it went through a lot of difficulties. And even actually, when we did the whole project, and then you guys have been running it for a few years, the, and Cornwall Council then was created after it became a unitary authority, um, we looked and then hand the whole site over. So Penworth District Council had actually held responsibility for the maintenance of the site. But when it became a unitary authority, they sort of said, why are we, why are we maintaining this place? And so we actually had the opportunity to buy Beaver Cross, the cottage next door. Part of the deal was the council would buy that for 300 and something or thousand pounds. And then, because you had that as an income generating thing, you would take a responsibility for the whole site. And so we did a sort of capital asset transfer. And then the trust. But it was mainly because the trust was doing so well. They wouldn't have done it if you'd been struggling, because you would have still wanted to be responsible owners. Um, but because the trust was doing so exceptionally well, we felt really confident as a council to say, actually, you can do this all now yourself. And rather than having all the difficulties of the council on your back, where you know, any change you wanted to do, you'd have to go to the council and got permission. You actually then, you know, this is yours, your baby now to, to play with, as it were. So I don't know what else we can. But I suppose part of the joy as well was that we had a lot of support from the Japanese embassy. Yeah. And I remember we did a fantastic <coughs> fundraising event <coughs> up in London. Yeah, they all went on to. I have a little bit about that. I, I won't. I won't um, well, no, it's all right. Because you've mentioned it. And no, we've no. been seeing some interesting pictures yeah. with some Japanese 
including Tom and Hamada. Yes. It's, yeah. it's yeah. Up, yeah. And they came there. over, the, the Japanese ambassador came down and over the opening day. Yeah, let, let me just read this paragraph because I'm sorry I've, I've sort of written it down, but I've said I'd li I should like to pay tribute to our many friends and supporters in Japan who raised money to help the restoration project. To Mr. F Futeo Matai, do you remember him? Yes, I do. He was head of Japanese Information and Cultural Centre at the Japanese Embassy in London. I, mean, I, I went and gave talks at the Japanese Embassy yeah. in London. I think you, you yeah. did too, Tamsin. Uh, and, and I'd like to thank and pay tribute too to the Jap all the Japanese Embassy emb ambassadors uh, during the time of this because um, they've always been tremendously supportive. And so was a gentleman called Sir Graham Fry. I haven't seen mm. him for many years, but he was UK amb ambassador in Japan. Uh, and he came to St. Ives, actually, to have a look at the pottery, yeah. remember? And the, so it had some very high level yes. support, actually, this project, because they felt it was very important for cultural relationship between UK and Japan, which indeed it was. And um, then we, the other thing I've written down here, just as a matter of interest, uh, do you remember that we had a, uh, an auction at Bonhams? Yes. And many, many potters gave work for the, for, the, uh, for the auction there. So I'd like to thank them, and, uh, because it, that raised for £40,000, that auction. That was in February 2008. So, um, so there was a lot going on. And we had a lot of support from some very important people. Anyway, so I'm, I'm happy as anyone else on the panel to have questions and things like that, and or any, but any other cultural things in Cornwall that might you might be interested in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. That was extremely helpful. Um, kind of Acknowledgement, actually, of, of just how um, that personal investment to deliver a kind of cultural and corporate project is just so important mm. that there yeah. has to be passion as well as yeah. the pounds. Might be really interesting, actually, John. If you could, uh, could you say something about um, that connection between Mashiko yeah. and St. Ives, perhaps, perhaps in particular in relation to um, practice, and maybe say something about your recent trip uh, over to Mashiko as well, because that's a really important ongoing relationship, mm. located, I suppose, in the town, but but fundamentally around the Mashiko Museum of Ceramic Art as well. Yeah, I mean, Mashiko <coughs> has always been. I mean. Um, as, well, Mashiko has a, a real sort of passion for St. Ives. I think more than we have a passion for Mashiko. I mean, if you go to Mashiko, uh, which is where uh, Shoji Hamada, who um, came with Bernard to set up the Leech Pottery, he, he worked there all his life, and, and the town revere him tremendously. But the, the town itself um, thinks of St. Ives um, similar to themselves. They th they actually think that St. Ives is... I mean, Mashiko's got um, about 450 potters working there. And they think St. Ives is similar, that we've got 450 <laughs> potters working there, which is totally ridiculous. But um, <coughs> if you go, everyone in Mashiko knows the name of St. Ives, whereas probably in St. Ives it's not true in reverse. But um, they... Um, the town businessmen actually built this museum, um, uh, a ceramic museum, to uh, um, celebrate their traditions in ceramics. And within that there is um, um, a resource for um, potters to go, international potters to go, and, and work there as residents. And I, I did a residency last year. And I saw all, all the enthusiasm myself of um, um, how Mashiko felt about St. Ives. And I only had to say, oh, I'm, come, I'm from St. Ives. And uh, <laughs> I was well, come and have a cup of tea and, that, and everything. <laughs> so, um, but I think when we were doing the project and we, we wanted the support of Mashiko, I think we thought more as... Uh, an international support yeah. because we knew the council it was a good um, uh, thing for the council to, to be able to talk about international support um, but we didn't think we were going to get financial support but um, the town got together and raised the money for St. Ives I, I think it was 15,000 yeah. they raised something like that yeah. 
No, I think it was more like 50 odd, you know. Was it? I think it really was. I have in my, my mind something like between 40 and 50,000 they raised yeah, over there. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure. I remember that one. It was yeah. about that, wasn't it? Oh, right. I didn't yeah. realise yeah. that much. Yeah. yeah. No, it was. Yeah. But then, then when the earthquake came, we, um, yeah. we reciprocated and did. We, there were many people that uh, contributed, including uh, Paul and... Um, Catherine. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine guitarist. is a um, guitarist and, and she, she made a record for Mashiko. Um, and she did a concert for Mashiko. It was all many projects like that uh, that all contributed to our funding towards Mashiko, and they really appreciated it. I, know, I don't know, how, I've forgotten how much we raised for 42, that. Forty-two, I think. It was, was it? Yeah, you are. Something like that. So it was very similar to the first yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so and and then when I remember, I remember in, the, in two thousand, I'd, I'd gone to Japan and I, um, I was working in Shigaraki. Um, I visited Mashiko and I've been asked by some people in the town to, to um, see if Mashiko uh, wanted to twin with St Ives. And um, so I, I saw some of the great and good in Mashiko and asked them about twinning. And um, they just jumped on me. That we've always wanted to twin, we've always wanted to do something like that with St Ives. So I came back full of enthusiasm but unfortunately when I... Um, came back, the people that asked me had lost their enthusiasm and uh, it never happened. But then um, when later the Mashiko and, and St Ives Town Council decided they, they would make this friendship agreement, uh, it, it seemed to complete the circle and, make, and for me, I felt guilty about the original approach and now it had happened. It, um, and now they send school children over and it seems to be a one-way passage at the moment. That's the thing which is still disappointing and I was talking to Libby about this earlier on. It seems such a shame that we've not sent mm. kids from the school here over to Mashiko. Mm. And yet they're able to do it. They do fund, mm. they must raise funds in some way and appreciate mm. that cultural link. And yet for whatever reason mm. we have not sent kids from here over to there. I think we should set this as our challenge between now and 2020. Mm. Yeah. On your list. Yeah. <laughs> there, is a, there is a twinning organisation. Yeah, but the twi but thing is, is, the twinning thing is more to do with the war, isn't it? And I no, think, no, no, was it not? No, I thought it was like a. Oh. If, you, if you notice on the side, yeah. it says twin with camera. Yeah. In, yeah. Uh, it is twin with camera. And uh, we had uh, an arts project a few years ago yeah. um, t shirts. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and it was very difficult to actually, uh, well, the, I think the town council had forgotten mm. that they were twins, mm. despite the fact that it's emblazoned on the... I don't know what the difference between twinning and friendship is, really. Well, no, and uh, obviously this is one that you know, has lasted mm. longer. And it's more a, about... But there is a, co a committee that was set up, well, I'm saying, but last year there was a committee, but uh, I've not seen anything other than mm. the uh, the arts project that mm. we run. That yeah, I think there is a danger that it's a bit of a one direction yeah. thing, yeah. and it, with all these twinning things, mm. I get the feeling that it, the, the 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 country abroad, whatever it is that we're twin with, are keener than somehow what we are. Mm. They usually have the funding streams um, yes. to send people over, whereas That's we right. don't. But I'm, not, but I'm not sure we ever asked. That's the thing. I don't think I've actually ever asked for the money to send some kids from the school here over. Yeah. Mm. So I think perhaps there's a level of apathy on our side mm. of not seeing the benefit for kids to go over to Mashiko and experience that culture. Yeah. And I think that's what we should really be pushing. Yeah. 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 And there just is the, the fleeting hope that with the Tokyo Olympics in 2020 there might be some cultural investment and there clearly will be cultural investment even in Japan in order to drive a program there. That, that, that would be that, no, that's that's because they've they got the 100 year centenary. Yeah, and no, it comes together really so, mm, yeah, potentially. Yeah. John, it would seem a shame not to ask you uh, <laughs> just to reflect on your own knowledge and understandings from having been a potter in the pottery mm. and how you feel about the changes that have been invested in the, the ten-year-old project, because that must have been a really complicated thing to kind of draw out what this project was going to be, this mm -hmm. kind of synthetic 
realignment of its component parts to put it into the kind of single thing. It's a very complex project and it's a complex place now. So could you say something about what it was like to work there and what do you feel yeah, the mean, mood is now? So well, I, I originally joined the Leech as a, a, a student apprentice, we were called them, and uh, it was a scheme that um, uh, it was a two-year apprenticeship um, and it was for training young potters and some experienced potters came as well. Um, <clears throat> and when, after, when Bernard died, um, Janet decided to stop this scheme um, and I noticed the, the heart went out of the pottery. It, it was the, the, the people that were training there, uh, the, their enthusiasm and their, their spirit that, that was the heart of the pottery. And so for me, the, the project always had to have that, that, um, that side to it. And, um, and, it, it and, and I'm really pleased with the way Ruloff's um, managed that side of it because it, it is complicated. Uh, I mean, because um, <clears throat> with um, training young potters, you, you lose the continuity. I mean, John Leach has, has a pottery and he has sort of like a staff, just staff members. Mm. Whereas Rulo's having to deal with a, um, uh, different people coming through and training them up and mm. having a consistency mm. in the work. Um, so it, it is difficult, but it's so worthwhile because um, we can't train our craftspeople in, in colleges. They need workshop practice and experience. Um, and for me, that, that was one of the most successful uh, sides of the project. Well, it might be quite interesting, for, maybe for Louis, just to say a little bit about... Because there are trainees come through now, aren't there, and apprentices and... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, yeah. It, it's, that has been the most happened. Yeah. Yes, I mean, Louis and Rulof. And also, and even, even have just a few years' connection. When they go and set up their own studios, yeah. they'll always be connected yeah. to each yeah. pottery. Yeah. 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 Well, as Ma Sorry. Of course, there's Marion Wybrow's great book, I've always thought about mm. this, that, that describes that legacy mm. of the potters, who, yeah. which, if you did now, mm. would be an equally valuable, important thing mm. to do and would tell you a slightly different story. But yeah. the ethos, yeah. the fact that that ethos has been retained, and we have fine young potters in the audience here today, located at the, the pottery, is so significant. And I'm sure has helped secure the Arts Council funding in the project, which is really, really important. But when, when, um, when it came up for sale again the second time, it, you know, there was a danger that it could turn into a, a, a cheap tourist sort of copy of the Leech yeah. Pottery, and that, that was what I feared, because I, I wanted uh, it to preserve its integrity. Um, and um, uh, and the, the whole ethos of, of how Leech felt about training potters yeah. and, and the, the standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, for me also, I sort of felt that you know there are a lot of museums who struggle to um, have a level of independence from funders. And when we set this up, I saw that there was the potential for its business model to not be dependent on grants. Mm -hmm. And that through creating a really high quality destination shop, yeah. gallery, yes, yeah, selling gallery space. Yeah. So you had the you had different, I suppose, components. You had the heritage part. You had the working studio bringing through the next lot of talents and all the rest. You had this fantastic um, selling gallery. Um, and then you know, later on, of course, with Beacon Cross also having sort of the community workspaces, residential, potters and residency opportunities, there was enough of a sort of a range of things where money could be earned to actually make the, the project sustainable. I think a lot of small museums, so at the end of the day, this gets fewer than 20,000 through the door for selling tickets for the heritage bit. It just wouldn't have been sustainable. And so for me, I mean, you know, the council, we, we fund a number of organisations knowing that it's, they're of great value, but they're never going to wash their own face necessarily. Um, whereas for here, because I think those components were right, you do actually find that you can, as it were, cross-subsidise each other. But also that you're bringing people in, you know, your, your online, your gallery space is so important to see how Potters today, it is that showcase yeah, of yeah, Potters yeah. today, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a very visionary synthesis yeah. of yeah. those component yeah. parts. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a question at the back. Yes, may I yeah. um, just add something that I feel 
should be um, included in all this because it will be so interesting. Well, exactly. I certainly should say that all the project files are sitting with the archive. Well, yeah. So if you wanted to go through it in detail, <laughs> I, I deposited all the files with Janet when Penalty to Cancel was dissolved. <laughs> but, but I wanted to uh, remember two particular things while yeah. we're sort of reminiscing. Um, and your mention of Marion Wybrow mm. um, came to mind because we did have this very good local group. Um, yeah. who helped. Yeah. And they organised two um, ceramics fairs yes. at the Guild Hall, right. I seem to right. remember. And they had all sorts of stalls. Mm. And that must have brought in a certain amount of money. Mm. So I wanted to remember that. But mm. the other thing I wanted to remember, which I was actually personally involved with, was that wonderful archaeological dig. Oh, that was that great. Would you like to just mention that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That was very special. Oh. With with the lottery funding, it's like a, it's a two stage process for getting lottery money, and in the sort of the middle stage, you had to do what they called a sort of a conservation management plan to you know understand the heritage better. And at the bottom of the site, it was also because the, the St Ives flood prevention scheme was happening, and they were doing an awful lot of digging all the way down the Stanock, and they were going to put that weir, a water handling thing at the bottom of the site, and we knew that that was a dumping ground yeah. for the leech pottery. Yeah. So we thought, well, before South West Water get in there, we just dig the whole lot up. We got a bunch of volunteers. It was brilliant fun. <laughs> so we just, we just did an archaeological dig, and we found, obviously, lots and lots of shards and things like that, some whole pieces. We found a bicycle in there. <laughs> you know, we spent ages thinking, like, this is so interesting. No, it's going to be a bicycle. It's definitely a bicycle. Um, but it was, we came up with boxes and boxes of stuff, didn't Which we? Which were in my garage for quite yeah. a long time. <laughs> they were. <laughs> But then from that, we selected some of the better bits. So then yes. we had the school you, you took collection. them all back. Yeah. yeah, so we sort of went through it. And then, but also, we, we sold bits of it as a fundraiser, didn't we? Particularly bits which actually oh, had yeah. the pottery marks. Mm -hmm. And people would come up and yeah, they'd pay like a pound and you got a, you know, a bit of pottery. But my mum remembers as a little kid, though, when you used to go down and play down the beach, and the stomach would wash it all down, you'd yeah. find bits yeah. of pottery yeah. just down there yeah. on the beach as well. Because it used to get thrown yeah. in, in yeah. the yeah. stomach yeah. stream. Yeah. You also found some tiles of mine that... Uh, uh, test tiles, yes. a whole range of yes. test, and I remember these. <laughs> I was trying to achieve this glaze that only Bernard had access to, and I'd, I'd made about a hundred tests, and they dug them all. <laughs> I, I, I remember <laughs> this memory of those tiles. <laughs> And there were some obviously some disaster kiln finds where you actually had all everything like merged together. So you had this sort of block of like you know four or five different. That's pots where the disasters all, always yeah. ended up. <laughs> Chucked down the bottom yeah. of the site, but that was a great community project though. We had I think about two weeks or something. We were we just scrambling around digging everything up, and it was brilliant. Yeah. What was the reaction like, say, so to speak, the week after the, the, the refurbished and reopened pottery that uh, you know come alive again? Do, do you have any recollections of that? I'm recalling actually that Janet's been terribly helpful in my research and drawing attention to that moment in 1920 when the pottery was being set up and Beach had to write to the St. Ives Times to say, I'm not building a factory here, don't worry, it's going to be oh, absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. So there was a kind of nervousness in the air, so to speak. Was, was, there any, was it pure celebration? Did, did, what was the kind of public? Uh, initial response. I really remember just incredibly being very po people being very yeah. proud of the project having happened, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people just forgotten because the building was so derelict, forgotten mm -hmm. actually yeah. what it was, yeah. and it was something about um, you know again part of St Ives' story, which had been retold to itself. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't remember I any think, negative. I think had, no, I don't either. I mean, I think actually, as far as I remember, the reopening was March, I think, of, yeah. the, of yeah. that year. Yeah. And uh, and it had had quite a bit of partly through the Japanese embassy mm. actually had had quite a bit of publicity. And H. Ray yeah. came down and filmed. And a lot of visitors came. Yes, yeah. it was a and film crew. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that was a Japanese film yeah. company came and filmed down here. Mm. And uh, and it was gaining quite a bit of interest. Mm. I, um, but I remember going to that visit internationally. Visit. I mean, the Vista book, like a year on, going through and flicking through everyone's mm. comments. But what was so surprising, shouldn't have been that surprised, was how many people were international. Yes. Yeah, sure. So whereas so many of the other attractions, you get visitors from sort of M5, M6 at a corridor. This was a truly international destination. And, you know, other than your Stonehenge and Bath, a thing that was really pulling people deep into the southwest. Uh, um, in fact, in a way, more internationally, than, than sort of the, the local tourists. The yeah, local tourists yeah, yeah. who came here to St. Ives did everything down in the town. 
And the fact that Leech Pottery is up a hill mm. seems to have, you know, in a way, they thought, oh, no, I can't well, that was one of our worries, there. wasn't it? it? Was. Yes, it was. No car parking. No car parking, yeah, parking yeah, bus yeah, service, yeah, and everything yeah. like that. But we launched that, um, it's like a, a joint ticket there, wasn't it? Between yes, the Penley House, the Leech Pottery, Tate. Yeah. And yeah. again, that just helped yeah. us do that bit of joint promotion, I seem to Yeah, remember. that was good. Yeah. But there's other questions from the floor. We don't sort of see yes, it can I, to ourselves. Can I ask John, or, or maybe anybody else on the panel? Um, I've known John a very long time, um, given when he started. <laughs> <laughs> I've been the pottery. In fact, you bought some of my work as well. <laughs> in fact, you made me. You made me my own personal mug one time. Mm -hmm. um, and Tree as well. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, the, the question I've got is. Prior to um, Bernard arriving and building in 1920, did St Ives as such uh, ever have a, a tradition in pottery? No, I don't I know. Don't, I, I there was a craft movement. I think it was yeah. part of what was beginning to form in St Ives was this yeah. recognition of some of the crafts. And so yeah. there was, um, I think it was like... There was, I was saying it's one of the things that the Francis Horn set up. And she thought that pottery up. was the missing yeah. element. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are other yeah. crafts in the town that are not pottery. But not specific to pottery, no. No. And no. the other thing, which, when you were talking about what's an, you know, what the whole of Cornwall's got mm. in mm. terms of pottery, of course, there's China clay. Yeah, <laughs> which, there were other pottery. Well, yes, but not locally. We, Bern, Bern, a number of the earlier potters thought, oh, that's great, we'll dig up local clay. And actually, it isn't, there isn't clay locally. Well, exactly. But they had to go miles away. There were it. earlier potters. I mean, the true what was it called? The true pottery. What was that one called? <coughs> That's um, Blake's yeah. pottery. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there were, there were yeah. earlier potteries. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, St Ives was famous for painting. Obviously, yeah, you know, at that stage in the early part of the twentieth century. But that's, I mean, that's what Bernard brought. You see, I mean, there, there was no um, the craft pottery, handmade pottery, uh, um, uh, uh, disappeared. Yeah. Uh, through the Industrial Revolution, yeah. Yeah. and Bernard brought back from Japan yeah. the idea that you, you know yeah. that um, pottery could be made into some sort of yeah. art form. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, of course, that spawned quite a few others: Mermaid and Troika, and yeah. it, it spawned yeah. them all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. everyone yeah. else that came along. Yeah. I, I was just surprised that I'd never actually asked myself that question. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what 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 was there before Bernard? Yeah. And the answers. I mean, a recent much. project I've been doing is actually looking at um, Neolithic pottery here in Cornwall. Yes. And, and again, you've got that whole Gabriel clay. I mean, we were actually, in Neolithic yeah. times, we were exporting pottery from mm. here outwards and we're doing some amazing <coughs> forms. There's a um, Helen Martin, who's an experimental archaeological yeah. potter. She re recreated a few pieces for an exhibition yeah. I was doing at King Edward Mine based on some of the Shards in the Royal Cornwall Museum of Neolithic pots. Yeah. And she went and dug it again from Cambrai, the actual clay, did all the treatment mm. work we were meant to do, bonfire fired it, mm. saw how different <coughs> it was to actually get whole pots out of the end and things. But beautiful, beautiful pieces have been created. So, yeah, but so, you know, with the, yeah. we do have clay, and of course, English time. Yeah, but, not, wrong, but, but not, 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 not in no. St. Ives in the area here, no. which is granite. Mm. But the thing was, in, in the <coughs> 1980s, the recession, um, I noticed particularly that. Um, uh, craftspeople um, were, were struggling and a lot of potters disappeared at that point. Yeah. Um, um, part of my, when I opened the Joey Art Studios, was to try and bring back um, some potters mm. into town. Because um, the leech pottery, I said, was going into sort of decline because uh, there were no, uh, there was just a couple of potters that were up there, you know, we've mentioned them, um, but there were no students anymore. Um, and I wanted to bring back some of that uh, that feeling of uh, pottery happening in St Ives. Mm -hmm. you know, through and, you, and you did well, John. I think you did really well okay. on that because mm -hmm. people have, you know, they often mention. Uh, in fact, they they often have, whenever I spoke to them, they have uh, visitors. They have a problem remembering jail yard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was the town jail, wasn't it? It was a town yeah, jail, yeah. For a while. Yeah. But I think this is what you know, what has been transformed within sort of West Cornwall in particular, perhaps, is that actually, you know, we're, we're moving now much more to being recognised for as a centre of creative industries and craft and the rest. So people actually are coming down here to set up their studios. So it's not that you're opting out of London. This is actually a very positive place to have your studio and to create work. There's also a market for it, for it down here. And, you know, it's finding the studios. It's, well, but, yeah, but we have, I mean, like Crouchy, 
um, has now got 100 yeah. something, mm. we're all totally full, we're looking at another phase, another wing to put on. I've just created another nine workspaces up at King Edward Mines. So one of the things I'm trying to do with yeah. some of our ex-mine buildings is actually to create them as workspaces. That's good. Um, because you know, we, we do have historic buildings without a purpose. And I think one of the things you can do, again, to help look after them in the future, the best thing you can do with historic buildings is give them actually a, a functioning purpose. Mm. And that pays the bills to keep, them, keep the roofs on. So one of the things I do a lot of is trying to repurpose some of those sorts of mine buildings and others. And they create fantastic workspaces. Over at Harvey's Foundry, that project's coming to an end oh, now, and those workspaces are being gobbled up. Because, they, again, they're a lovely environment. They create interesting buildings. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, did you say crou crouchy? Crouchy. So, that it's is Red Ruth, yeah, so Red Ruth Old Grammar School. So, is um, that the one in Red Ruth? Yes. Oh, I know. So, we, we've got this massive Crescent Kernel archive being built on the old brewery site. site. Um, and just above that, the, the Red Ruth Grammar School was given over to Greater Kernel, you mentioned before, the yeah. Ross Williams runs. And I think the council gave it to him for a quid about 10 years back or something. And he first of all just opened up the old grammar school. Chris, you, I mean, Chris on the trustees or whatever, aren't you? So the old grammar school just opened up as a rough and ready workspace. But then Ross, with the trustees, raised European money to create a whole new building, which is called something like the Williams, Percy Williams Building. It has about 100 studios in it. And it's now, this last couple of months, is totally at capacity now. Begin, it's a sort of easy in, easy out, affordable workspace. Yeah. Um, has a whole range of people working from there. But now looking at another phase, depending on what happens with Brexit. Just another say phase. where it is. Where Drew's Grammar School? Yes. yes. Yeah, where well, you're trying. It's yes. just on the outside of the town, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Of the yeah. Town. yeah. So if, if you're on the old, the old mm. A13, <coughs> you actually see the new building emerging from there where yeah. the Redry School had its um, football pitch and stuff. So there are workspaces sort of around. <coughs> and again, Chris, you've got your artist studios here, obviously, but also linked in with Newland and stuff. So one of the things that one of the only ways that the cultural sector got its hands on European funding was through workspaces, because it was around jobs, employment, training and skills. It was almost impossible for us to get European funding for projects which are just purely cultural. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Tate was ineligible for European funding, even though it was contributing £16 million a year to the local economy. But because there just wasn't a hook for the Tate <coughs> to get into European money. Um, the Hall for Cornwall, which we're just kicking off the tendering for now, um, that's got European funding, but only for the workspaces on the Lemon Key side, not for the central auditorium or anything. So the European funding has been quite difficult for the cultural sector to get into, but where it's been successful is projects like this one we're sitting in today. And if we, you know, Leach Pottery is one of the early ones with European Regional Development Funding. Mm. Yeah. We, we have a big problem here in the fact that they didn't accept that artist studios was a high value. Yeah. Yeah, until we brought them down and introduced them to the artists, and the artists talked about their food chain, yeah. that it's not just about the artists, it's about everything else around the artist, from the galleries, from the people who are producing their paints, through the canvases, through the you know, catalogues, that that one artist is actually keeping quite a food chain alive around that person. I think when we took the European lot to meet Naomi here, we thought, oh, okay, they are quite high value. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Initially, they, 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 they would much prefer it if they were all web designers or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it felt artists would use far too much space, I think. But that's why, that's why Farmthe University closed down the ceramics course, mm. because cost per head mm. of a ceramics student that yeah, needed yeah, yeah, well, 10 foot square of space versus yeah. a web designer who could just sit at a, at a laptop, yeah. they could squeeze far more students into, you know, doing a gaming. But Degree people course. wouldn't come down here for web design. No. <laughs> I mean, they come down for the atmosphere and the, mm, yeah. the, the art community that they feel is here. Yeah. So, and, and we do and actually have, they a, have, they have a thriving understand. gaming sector here and all the rest, because also the people who work with you know, digital can position themselves anywhere in the world. And so that's the part of Cornwall, is that you say you can have a really quite a good lifestyle here in Cornwall <laughs> when you're working yeah, digital. Yeah. <laughs> so while they're not very visible, they are sitting in their homes <laughs> doing games. <laughs> and funnily enough, actually, Cornish language, which also comes into my... Um, I look after Cornish language stuff as well. Um, some of the gaming community are using Cornish language in their games to test how... You know, rather than using Klingon, which used to, you know, they're actually using Cornish. They sort of <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Sounds like Klingon to me. <laughs> That's quite simple. Yeah. Yeah. Could you just talk about one other thing? I'd like you to talk about the garden. Well, actually, the garden and the new studios. I mean, the new studios, you might think, oh, they've just yeah. d definitely gone for a Japanese style. 
But actually, it, became, it was because of doing new build on a flood area that, in fact, the Environment Agency forced us to put it onto stilts. And so then naturally, the architect thought, well, stilts in Japan will make something look quite Japanese. But also then, then you created this rather nice sort of enclosed garden area. We wanted to sort of create that link. And I think, again, if we're giving thanks to people, what was the nursery that gave all the plants? Was it, oh, it was the um, Hardy Exotics on the way down to Penzance at um, whatever it's called, Thimaji Cross. Yeah, so they, they donated those bigger ferns and stuff, oh, I seem to remember. Yeah, yeah. And looked after them in the first year, because I was a bit nervous of them dying. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes. Yeah. yeah, so actually the new studios, you might think, oh, well, they've just naturally put them on stilts. We had to, to get over the flood stuff. And in fact, we've got two big... You, you may not know this. Oh, well, we had this conversation the other day. The two big water, water tanks, tanks. Yeah, under there know, for catchment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't go drilling down too much. <laughs> <laughs> the plans are all with Janet in the archive. <laughs> yeah. Because it was just a field, wasn't it, originally? Well, it was, it looked like that. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought it, it looked very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was good to sort of keep the whole sort of ethos yeah. about it. It's we did have that classic thing. Yes. Yeah. We did have that classic thing that architects sort of do where they want to make their statement was the original architects, they wanted to do a copper roof. And I think, we, A, it was going to cost like 100,000. I said, I don't have 100,000. So he said, OK, we'll have a copper roof, but we'll have copper um, downpipes and all the rest. And so, oh, right then. And I think the day the builders moved off site, they, they got, got nicked. <laughs> classic. You know, I can say that being Cornish, classic Cornish. The copper, the copper went overnight. I've forgotten Yeah, <laughs> but, almost, but they pulled it off. They then also took some of the roofing off as well. They had to do a repair job before the opening. Oh, it's bringing back memories now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The chains. Yeah, those chains. Yes, they, they went. And they'll be, yes. Yeah, yeah. The water. Yes, the water trickles down the chains, and then we're into like a little gathering thing underneath. Yeah. All these different ways you relate with the general public. <laughs> yeah. Including yeah. getting those nicked. Well, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. We're on a rolling programme of talks here, so yes. I wonder if I could just quickly ask you, talk about the, the living legacy mm. of the, um, the studio and so on, and the training programme, which I think is really interesting. I wondered whether, how, what, what state say that is at now, and what potters are coming through now, and whether you have, what is the sort of future, what do you see the next 10 years, or... I mean, living. Yeah, living. Yeah, we're actually going to talk about it. Yeah, we're actually going to talk about it this afternoon. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, of the three right. talks, it's yeah. the third one that we're, we're going to go into more detail. Oh, okay. But essentially, yeah, we're taking on a, um, sort of one apprentice every two years at the moment. Um, so it's relatively small scale, but they get three years worth of training. Mm. And um, we also have a volunteer programme where people come for about 12 months and live on site. Interesting. And, and who, is, who are the teachers? Who are, who are the permanent <laughs> teachers? Rudolf Sadiq Potter. So, yeah, he oversees all of the teaching. But then um, I think, you know, as they're going to talk about this okay. afternoon, yeah. it's very much a studio working together mm -hmm. and they help each other and they teach each other. And, um, you know, so they're, they're, they're so working very as, much as a team. Talking about earlier that it's it's very much the way it yeah. works yeah. in my time now. Uh, yeah, you, everybody taught you. I mean, yes. the, the whole room taught you. Yes. Basically. Yeah, and the Japanese influence does that? Well, you've had the Potters in residency. One of the nice things Sorry, we bought um, when we, no, we, okay. we bought Beagle Cross, the next door cottage, it op opened up the opportunity to have residencies then. And so people like Tom Muhammad came down again for a longer period, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Did sort of an exhibition yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. worked in a yeah. different yeah. workshops. Yeah. My workshop, yeah. you worked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there have been, uh, you know, visits, group visits, haven't yeah, there, uh, yeah, by uh, uh, people from Japan, both the council and, and by mm -hmm. mm -hmm. potters. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not quite such an active thing as during the restoration period. Mm -hmm. Actually, while I was in Japan during that residency, there was um, a teacher come over from St Ives uh, School uh, oh, right. to, yes. to do some, uh, I don't know what she was doing really, she was doing some research. Mm -hmm. and So I don't know whether anything came out of that. You know, whether yeah, they be sending yeah. anyone over. Yeah. Because I don't think they've sent anyone over. But we've, yeah. we've had about probably three or four trips of, I don't know, of, of uh, yeah. Japanese students, um, but none going the other way. Yeah. I think once a year we've had. Yeah. With the school yeah. too. Yeah. 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 It is quite, it is quite embarrassing. <coughs> mm. 
that's not reciprocated. Yeah. I don't think I can always feel mm. I have mm. to say sorry about that when I speak to people. Mm. Well, there we go. Maybe that's the goal for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've had an hour's really stimulating conversation. Thank you all for your participation. But would you join me in thanking Tamsin Carroll and.